Welcome back to my YouTube channel, everybody. Today, we have a podcast instead of a video. And my guest is Professor Elizabeth Perez, who's an historian and ethnographer at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Together with Elizabeth today, we will be talking about the Santeria, which is a religion uh, which was born in the Caribbean and then moved to Florida. And today is pretty popular in the States. Thanks for your time, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Would you like to introduce yourself and say something to my viewers about yourself and your background and why you're so qualified to talk about Santeria? Yes, thank you. Um, well, my name is Elizabeth and um, I'm Cuban American. My parents are actually both Cuban, from, but from Guantanamo, from the southeast of Cuba. And there was actually not very much Santeria there, there are a lot of different Afro-Cuban traditions. And so I don't stake my qualifications on my background, um, but really from my academic training, um, I did a master's degree and PhD at the, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Um, and luckily I was able not just to work with mentors there on Afro-Cuban and really Afro-Caribbean and Latin American traditions, um, but do my own work, do my own ethnography, um, ask questions, participant observation, formal interviews um, since about 1999. So um, I'm happy to be able to uh, talk to your audience uh, about my own experience and then some of the research I've done. Well, just to start, first of all, can you explain us how Santeria was born when African religions were brought to America and the two cultures had somehow to merge? Yeah, so um, in order to explain that, I would want to just kind of outline the transatlantic slave trade. Um, you know, some of us in the U.S. have a very, um, very collapsed, very um, short idea of how many years um, slavery really uh, took place because we're thinking about North American slavery, maybe starting in the British colonial period. Um, but in fact, you have enslaved people arriving in the Caribbean as early as 1515. Um, the Portuguese had already started, um, really kicked off the trade in enslaved people in the 1490s. Um, off the, the, the coast of Central Africa. And so there is a long period of time in which many different ethnic groups are being brought to the Caribbean and um, other places in the Americas, uh, you know, in, in the, starting in the 16th century, basically. And so uh, those people who really contributed to the formation of Santeria, they arrived in Cuba in the early 17 um, and eight, the 17 and 1800s, but the early 1800s is when you have um, a very important historical event, which is the breakup of the Oyo Empire. It was a pretty large empire that was stretched from, um, you know, what is today Nigeria, um, north and also east. Um, with the breakup of that empire, a lot of different um, peoples who, you know, today we would call them Yoruba peoples, were kind of um, pressed, uh, you know, into service in different ways. Um, you know, they were enslaved not only among their own peoples, but they were kind of pushed towards the coast because of the massive disruption of the breakup of that OU empire in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And so uh, coincidentally at that time, the Haitian revolution happens. The Haitian revolution happens, uh, begins 1791 and basically wipes uh, the, the colony of San Domingue off the map. It, it was the largest, you know, sugar producing colony in the Caribbean at that time. And so Cuba kind of is going to want to take up the role as a sugar producer. And so you have all of these different factors leading to the massive importation of enslaved people um, who were, you know, basically refugees in some sense from the OU empire who were then, you know, captured, sold into slavery um, by different European groups. But, you know, in this case, of course, we're talking about Cuba, we're talking about the Spanish and the Spanish crown really um, privileging the importation into its colonies of peoples who had not been Islamicized. So, 
um, the Spanish crown did not want to have enslaved people who uh, were from the Senegambia, for example, because of their very recent experience with Muslims on the Iberian Peninsula, right? The, the Iberian Peninsula had been to some extent ruled by Muslims between 711 and 1492. So they really were hoping to have enslaved people who were, you know, so-called pagans who did not, you know, have a monotheistic tradition in order to be able to convert them to Christianity. Um, so that is in essence how we have people who have a Yoruba culture, a Yoruba language, and Yoruba deities, divination systems, and mythologies arriving in Cuba um, in really large numbers in the early 19th century. Okay, can you explain us who the Orishas are and what is the relationship with the saints of the Catholic Church? Yes, and so um, the Yoruba deities are called Orishas, and they are part of a pantheon. And so um, when I say that, I'm relying in part on this image of the, you know, Greco-Roman pantheon, where you have different spirits with um, familial, in some sense, relations to each other, or affinal, you know, relations by marriage to each other. There is a creator deity um, who is kind of neither male nor female, um, but, you know, nevertheless, in some sense, brings the universe into being called Olodumare, also called Olorum or Olofin. Um, those, those words refer to kind of different aspects of that being's existence. But the idea is that that being delegated different responsibilities to the Orishas. Um, another concept here with relation to the Orishas is Ashe. So Ashe is a kind of primordial energy that is latent in everything material, everything that exists in the universe, but it can be activated. It can sort of be, um, trans, you know, become a transformative force, um, you know, depending on the way that, that that materiality is worked with. And so the deities embody certain kinds of ashe, certain forms of ashe. And so um, you've got, you know, pri you've got kind of the, the deity who opens and really, you know, really closes the door of opportunity named Elegua. And so there's an important relationship between Olodumare and Elegua. He's the guardian of the crossroads. He's the one that needs to be propitiated anytime some kind of new venture, anything new um, begins, even the start of the week on Monday. Um, and Elegua is, you know, considered to be um, it, you know, in, in some ways, uh, also the witness to people's destinies, there are divination systems that I mentioned, kind of oracles and orishas that are related to those oracles. And then there are primary deities that were really maintained, um, in Cuba. And so when someone gets initiated according to, uh, sort of like a Cuban, style of Orisha worship, they receive at least four different Orishas. And I can explain what I mean by receive later. Um, but one of them will be Obatala, who is a sort of creator deity, um, you know, similar in some sense. He has a lot of ancestral energy similar to Olodumare, um, but has both male and female manifestations. Uh, considered to be kind of an elderly, very cool and wise spirit. There's Yemaya, who is the goddess of the ocean, of maternity, of maternal love, especially. Uh, Oshun, who is variously conceived of as her daughter or her sister. And Orisha is, uh, the Orisha Oshun is, is really, um, in Cuba, the guardian of sweet water, sort of lakes and rivers, romance sort of you know sexual um pleasure and also intelligence a kind of shrewdness really characterizes oshun and then you have shango who is kind of the consummate um leader uh he symbolizes virility and rulership um the son of yamaya actually and so when these kinds of deities entered cuba they, the, the situation in which enslaved people found themselves was such 
that the Catholic Church, you know, was was intent on socializing them into the practice of Catholicism. Um, and one of the ways they did that was not just through baptizing enslaved people, because enslaved people were not really seen as as full persons. I mean, just the same way that enslaved people were baptized, the machinery at sugar plantations was also baptized, was sprinkled with holy water. Okay, so um, enslaved people were not really considered to be, you know, fully functional human beings. They were, they were chattel in some sense. They were the property of other human beings. And so the Catholic Church um, instituted these, um, you can call them societies called cabildos. And cabildos were already extant on the Iberian Peninsula in Portugal and Spain. Um, they were these kind of associations that the church and the nobility funded, provided space for, in order for enslaved people and free Black people to begin to venerate certain saints in order to develop a kind of devotion to the Virgin Mary, um, a, a dedication to a certain saint. And then they were encouraged to process, to actually take the streets on those saints' days, um, in order to, you know, in some sense, begin to kind of affiliate or attune themselves to the character of Catholicism. And so in Cuba, those cabildos were, were separated according to ethnic group. And so you have the Yoruba cabildos, they were called Lukumi. You have uh, Calabari or Cross River region, um, people put in cabildos that, are, that go on to be called Caravali cabildos. There are Congo cabildos, people from Central Africa are just kind of given this um, umbrella term of Congo and on and on. And so those cabildos were supposed to keep uh, enslaved people separate according to their language, according to their culture. But in fact, what happened is that they became kind of these um, th these kinds of incubation um, sites for the reconstitution of African religions because there were spaces where enslaved people and free black people were more or less um, left to their own devices. And so they developed these kind of systems of, um, there would be like a queen or a king of the cabildo. Uh, the elders were really given a lot of respect within the cabildos because they had perhaps been born in Africa. They knew the old ways of how to do things. And it was within the Lukumi cabildos that you have the formation of what will become Santeria. And so cabildos basically at the, you know, by the time the abolition happens in Cuba, in Cuba, which is actually quite a late abolition comparatively, um, the cabildos are already being persecuted because the colonial regime understands that uh, they have, you know, they have kind of gotten out of hand. Um, and so when free black people, you know, begin to live in their own neighborhoods, apartment buildings and dwellings, they bring with them then the worship of the Orishas. And then you kind of have this turning point. And the, the veneration of Orishas at that point is not called Santeria. People will just refer to that as witchcraft. You know, it's lumped in with just everything that is African derived. It's fetishism, quote unquote, or it's brujeria, it's witchcraft. Um, and that, that moniker Santeria only kind of really uh, takes on a, a certain amount of traction in the early 20th century. In Santeria also, the spirits of the dead have a very important role. Can you explain us where um, this comes <clears throat> from and what the role is? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, before, before us speaking to that, I just want to, you know, circle around back a little bit to, sure. you know, the Orishas that I mentioned. So, sure. um, you know, I mentioned Obatala, for example. Obatala will come to be associated actually with a, an image of the Virgin Mary, Mercedes. Oshun will come to be associated with the patron deity of Cuba, um, who is uh, Our Lady of Charity, Yemaya with the Virgin of Regla. Chango actually gets associated, even though, as I say, he's a virile, very masculine, with Santa Barbara. Um, and this is kind of a, 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 a correspondence that develops between the Orishas, because, in, you know, 
some people will say it was about masking. It was about masking the identities of the Orishas so that let's say, you know, slave owners did not know that enslaved people were worshiping African spirits. Um, but we know from archival documentation, we know from, you know, ethnographic material that we've collected that sometimes it was the willingness of enslaved people to really see divinity in and, and Ashe, to see the, the movement of Ashe in, you know, any kind of image of the divine. And so they reappropriated those images. And so when, you know, I don't really talk about syncretism in terms of Santeria, because there is not really a syncretic blend theologically between Catholicism and Santeria, but definitely uh, those who call, you know, practice what is called Santeria, they have creatively reappropriated the material culture of Catholicism. So the images of saints that resemble in some sense because of their colors, because of the images um, that are, you know, what the items that are seen in the images, they become associated with the saints. Um, and there are many different communities today, though, that have totally dispensed with that. They really don't use Catholic images whatsoever. Um, even in Cuba today, people uh, have differing views about, you know, what exactly is the nature of the correspondence um, between the Orishas and the saints. And just to follow up then on your next question about the, the role of ancestors. So ancestors in Santeri are called Egun. And people are believed to have lineage ancestors, blood ancestors, um, who are still relevant in everyday life. Um, the Yoruba, in, in the sense of West African Yoruba notion of personhood, is that um, when individuals die, that is not the end. They don't all, they also don't go to a kind of heaven or hell necessarily. They are reborn in the world. Um, they are reincarnated, but within their family lines. And so it's not like a sense of, you know, random reincarnation based on, you know, the virtues that you uh, displayed in your lifetime. It's more a sense that, you know, you will return within your family um, in another, another form, in another lifetime. So the notion here in, San, in, in Lukumi is that ancestors are really uh, important to propitiate because they are the ones who can help one forward. They, they in some sense, um, you know, can guide us through life. Uh, there are certain ancestors maybe that are more prominent for us personally, that would, you know, benefit from being remembered. And so there are rituals that will feed the ancestors that will literally offer them food, candles, um, sometimes cigar smoke, uh, in order for them to understand that they are being acknowledged um, before, you know, many different rituals, the egun first have to be either fed or somehow uh, recognized. And so um, another way of thinking about ancestors is that within religious lineages, there are ancestors. And so before almost any, uh, you know, Santeria ritual, there's going to be a prayer that's said that's called the Moyuba. And the Moyuba not only um, is a kind of litany that uh, calls out the cardinal directions that you know praises you know past generations that you know praises those who uh, came before us but that literally names uh, the people in one's lineage who initiated the people who initiated the speaker so um, you know I, when when I say the moyuba I'm basically you know kind of constructing a verbal family tree where I go from you know, Ines Garcia and Yenya Tolokun, who was uh, an important Olokun priestess um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to the person who initiated me. So I will, you know, say it's almost like um, if people know of, you know, in, in different forms of Buddhism, that there are lineage of lineages of monks that go back generations and generations. It's very similar. And so uh, the idea of ancestrality is really key because nothing can proceed without the blessing of the ancestors.
Is it correct to say that the Santero is the priest of Santeria? And uh, apart from this, what is the role of Santero in the religion and in the ceremonies? So that's a great question. So today people have a tendency to bristle against Santeria as a term because of the way that, you know, Santeria kind of means saint worship. It's, it's sort of like in some ways a... Um, a kind of criticism or it carries a negative connotation, let's say. So um, Q, people who were born and raised in Cuba or who practice the religion in Miami, they tend to have a very matter of fact attitude about the term Santeria. They don't tend to mind it necessarily. But the thing is, a lot of people are joining the religion who were not culturally Cuban. So you have people who don't speak Spanish as a first language who practice the religion. And people who are, you know, who are, uh, let's say, from Jewish backgrounds, from Asian backgrounds, uh, people like in the community that I did my doctoral field work, um, who are African American, who who don't say that they practice Santeria, they will say they practice Ifa, or they practice Orisha, okay, or even Yoruba traditional religion. They'll say, um, so they won't call themselves Santeros, but there there is a um, kind of uh, recognition that those who have been initiated into the priesthood um, are really the hierarchically highest in the religion. So um, in the community that I work with, instead of Santero, people will say that somebody who is initiated into the worship of the Orishas is an Olosha. Um, someone who is female, um, a woman who has initiated other people, who is, is, is effectively a spiritual mentor, um, is an Iyalosha. So she is the mother of the Orishas, or in some sense, a mother for the Orishas, because you're kind of, um, you are initiating people into the worship of Orishas and kind of giving them a new life in the religion. Those who are male, the men who initiate uh, people into the worship of the Orishas is an uh, Baba Losha, um, a father of the Orishas. And then you have specific terminology that relates to, you know, different functions. So the communities I work with, the kind of master of ceremonies of initiations is called an Oba Oriate. So he's kind of like a kingly figure in the sense that he knows all of the different technicalities of the way that the initiation ritual um, should be observed according to. So he is the one who, uh, or she is the person who you know, knows all of the different steps in the processes of initiation. Um, other communities uh, more so are headed by babalawos. Those are, um, usually cisgender and straight men who are able to perform Ifa divination. And the Orisha of Ifa divination is Orumila or Orula. And so sometimes Baba Laos have been, you know, narrated in the literature as the high priests of Santeria. But effectively, they perform a very specific function, which is that they are the ones who are kind of the guardians of the Ifa um, divination system. Uh, historically. And so there are, you know, really interesting gender implications of everything I'm saying, but, um, you know, we, we can get into those or not, depending on uh, the, the rest of the questions we have today. Well, let me first ask you to uh, elaborate on something you already mentioned. You mentioned witchcraft, which in this case is called Palo, if I remember well. What is the role of Palo in Santeria and what is it? Yeah, so you have this long tradition. Um, I mean, starting in, again, the early 20th century, um, a kind of slightly later moment um, when Santeria is kind of emerging as being better understood as really a religion with, you know, deities, with um, a moral ethical code, with different kinds of practices that are that are also, you know, um, that, that have discrete protocols, there is an effort to sort of create a foil um, or a kind of contrast 
you know, there's, there's very often um, in writing on uh, Afro-Cuban and, and really Afro-Caribbean religions in general, there is an effort to kind of create a good guy and a bad guy. And so Santeria kind of um, comes into public consciousness as the Afro-Cuban tradition that you know, seems a bit strange, but is really a religion just like any other. And Palo, um, which has Congolese roots, um, is constructed as kind of, oh, well, that's the bad one. You know, that there was some kind of category error where Santeria was lumped in with Palo. And Palo um, is just kind of a catch-all term to refer to different, um, different styles of worship that you find in Cuba, um, different ritual orthodoxies that are a Kong, kingdom of Congo in origin. Um, before the Yoruba arrived in Cuba in great numbers in the early uh, 19th century, in the early 1800s, um, Central Africans were actually the favored group um, to arrive in Cuba. And you'll see this in, in many different places actually in the Americas where the first group that had the terrible misfortune of being enslaved and brought and forced to work um, in the Caribbean and Latin America were people from Central Africa. And so they in Cuba developed traditions like Palo Monte, Palo Mayombe, um, what is called Regla Quimbisa, and other forms of, uh, of Reglas de Congo, or like the rules of the Congo spirits. Um, and the language they use ritually is totally different. Um, it's, it's Bantu based. Their uh, spirits are not Orishas, but Mpungu uh, or Inquises. Um, and also, and this is the, the feature that kind of has tended to make them seem like they are more demonic or more dark, is that they incorporate spirits of the dead in their practice to a greater extent. And not spirits of ancestors, um, but spirits of the dead that are, are uh, kind of ritually installed in their sacred objects. And because those sacred objects resemble cauldrons, um, because of the long association, uh, and, and I would say the stereotyping of Central African traditions as fetishism, you have a kind of, um, I think like more, um, you know, much more sensationalistic and stereotypical depiction of uh, what these uh, Palo traditions are. And so, you know, just to give you an example, um, I've written a little bit about how um, the rapper Azalea Banks has gotten a lot of backlash because she has kind of come out as a practitioner of Palo um, in recent years. And she's even shown some of her ritual objects on social media. Um, you know, she has boasted about uh, the animal sacrifices that she performed. And, you know, sadly, that's very much in keeping with, I think, the very sensationalized um, reportage and depiction of Palo Monte, um, you know, not just in, you know, in social media, but really even in, in anthropological texts, um, you know, several generations back. Um, what we can say, though, uh, about the relationship between Palo and Santeria is that these traditions really function along kind of different logics as some of the, the monotheisms that we are uh, accustomed to. So for an example, if I say that I'm Christian or, or Muslim or Jewish, that tends to connote that I am not a member of another religion, that there's a, there's a um, implication here that my, you know, the deity I worship is exclusive and I, I'm not worshiping any other spirits or deities. Um, however, these traditions are very much like um, traditional African societies in the sense of organizations that require membership. So you can be initiated in Palo. You can also be an initiate of Lukumi or Santeria. You can also be initiated into any number of different traditions. There's a tradition called Abacua in Cuba um, that comes from the, the Caravali people um, or, you know, the Car Carbali um, Cross River region folks. Um, who come from uh, between sort of Nigeria and Cameroon. Um, and it, it was not uncommon, uh, and it is really not today, to be Abakwa and to be Lukumi and to be Balo, and even then to have been baptized as Catholic. Um, because, what, you know, well, what, what is the thinking behind that? 
uh, it's that people's destinies are really radically individual. Your destiny is not the same as mine. And so you might be fine just worshiping the Orishas and deriving all the ashe that you need in life for prosperity, for health, um, for well-being just from the Orishas. But maybe I'm a person who needs the help of spirit guides. I need the help of Infumbi. I need the help of Orishas and Jesus Christ um, in order to really put me on my path. So it's, it's a, you know, it really goes against a kind of one size fits all approach to religiosity. Well, that's striking, as you mentioned, and very interesting, because it's totally surprising for us, Christians or mm -hmm. Muslims or uh, any other main religion in Europe yeah. to be practicing to two, two religions at the same time. Uh, I mean, is, yeah, no, no, ahead. I mean, just, you know, just to follow up, I mean, that's why, um, you know, scholars like me have a very interesting time trying to fit these traditions into the category of religion, because, you know, it's a really Eurocentric category in a way. Um, in a lot of uh, pre-colonial African cultures, there was really no one word for religion, because what people did was just culture. It was just, you know, their, their approach to the deities was a, of a piece with the approach to farming or to the approach to the marketplace. Um, and so, you know, for us to say religion, it really connotes something very different. Um, but at the same time, it's what it makes uh, studying these religions really exciting for me is that they're, they are unexpected. They kind of uh, do unpredictable things uh, that, that we are not accustomed to if we're um, a cut, if, if we kind of become socialized into that world religions paradigm. I totally agree. That's why I wanted to have you as a guest to discuss this because it's very uh, strange and, and unexpected topic that uh, I wanted to look into. Mm -hmm. uh, what are Santeria rice like and what are the most striking aspects? Uh, so I think one of the things that I would want to say about the rites is that there are certain rituals that, that are, are ceremonies that take place according to um, pretty pre predictable kind of, you know, calendrical cycles. And so, for example, I mentioned the association between um, or the correspondence between saints and Arishas. And so um, some people who do not like that connection between the Catholic saint and the Arisha, they, you know, just kind of disregard the feast days of the saints and the virgins, but there are others that do observe them. And so, for example, even yesterday was the feast day of an Orisha called Inle, who is associated with Saint uh, Raphael. And so there are people for whom that day is special. They might um, make a plate of food for that Orisha. And if, if they have him consecrated, they will present that food. They might do a drumming ritual to observe that day. Um, but, you know, there's a certain cycle that um, is organized according to the Roman Catholic calendar. So, you know, the feast day of, uh, the Virgin of Charity or of the Virgin of Regla, you know, those are days that some practitioners will observe. They're pretty much set in stone. If someone is initiated, they will also, um, celebrate the day that they got initiated every year with a special altar, or they, you know, try to kind of, um, you know, tidy up and maybe um, make a little bit more elegant the space where their orishas reside. And they will try to stay home all that day. Uh, they will make food for those orishas. They might have a drumming or even a violin. The orisha Oshun really loves violin music. So they will have maybe somebody play violin. Um, at the very least, they will re receive guests on those days. And so they're kind of like fixed moments in the calendar. And then the, the kind of initiation day or the quote unquote birthday of the person that um, is one spiritual mentor is going to be important because you're going to want to, if you can, if you can visit that person, if you can call them on the phone, it's an important day to kind of commemorate the sacrifice that they made in getting initiated. Now, most rituals though, don't take place according to a calendar like that. There's no Sabbath. So people every Sunday or every Saturday are not doing something for the Orishas. Um, generally, rites are um, scheduled according to, major rites are scheduled according to divinations that are performed to make sure that the Orisha wants certain things to happen. Um, but, you know, a typical, you know, let's say a typical month in a house of Orisha worship. 
um, you might have somebody receiving some of the first Orishas that are, that are given um, are called the warriors. So I mentioned Alegua, who is the opener and closer of paths. There is a little kind of cement head or image that usually has embedded cowrie shells that is consecrated. It's, it's, you know, made and um, the path of that Alegua, like the character that Alegua has, whether old or young, playful or grouchy, um, that will be something that the person receiving that object will know. Um, there's also, um, as part of the warriors, a kind of um, a two, two Orishas who work together. There's Ogun and Ochosi, and they both kind of reside with their sacred objects in a kind of like little cauldron shaped vessel. Um, and then there's a, a, a small staff with a little rooster on top, and that's Osun. And so, you know, in, in the course of a month, you might have somebody receiving the warriors. And that is a special ceremony that occurs where um, basically those Orishas are being asked to protect a person. And, you know, they, they you know, form a kind of like physical um, space in the home where a practitioner who's just starting out can kind of begin to develop their own sort of like domestic rituals that, you know, they will every Monday try to, or every Tuesday, they'll try to talk to a legua, they'll try to maybe give a legua cigar or some candy and really, you know, develop a kind of relationship with the Orishas. Another ritual that might happen is the giving of consecrated necklaces or beads called elekes. Um, typically, uh, about five are given in, uh, in a house of worship. And that really, what that means is that a person is affiliating with that community, that they are going to kind of set out on their path, whether or not they become initiated as a priest. Um, they are receiving these sacred necklaces. Um, they might spend the night at the home of their spiritual mentor. It's kind of like in some ways, a little bit of a recapitulation of what happens in the initiation ceremony. Um, and they will wear those necklaces then, um, you know, every day if possible, um, but they're for protection um, and they sort of confer a kind of sacred energy. Um, people who already have different Orishas may need to feed them periodically. And that means anything from offering them fruit, offering them dishes um, of, of different kinds of Yoruba based foods that they like. Or it could mean sacrifice. And that's, you know, a term that we really haven't mentioned yet, but the Orishas do um, receive sacrificial offerings. Generally though, they tend to receive them, uh, I, I would say typically when they are consecrated, that is to say when they're born, um, bloodshed is required. This is, you know, a tradition that doesn't make any bones about that. Um, and, and they each have certain animals that correspond to them that, you know, you can find the divination verse that says why, you know, that animal is the one that they need to receive, um, you know, in sacrifice. Um, and then at different times periodically, but it's not a kind of sense of a routine. Um, so, you know, for, for, you know, your listeners to know, um, that even though sacrifice does happen, um, it, it, it is not, um, you know, with, you know, it doesn't happen with abandon. It happens in a very formalized way and only really when, um, necessary for generally the health of the practitioner. So there are no fixed festivities such as Christmas, Easter, Ramadan, or anything of the sort. I mean, not, not as such. I mean, people will, um, within houses of worship, they will often observe um, New Year's Day as a day of Alegua. So very often I did my field work in a Black American Orisha community in Chicago. And so most practitioners did not speak fluent Spanish. They did not identify as Latino in any way. Um, but around New Year's, there would be the uh, tambor or a drum ritual that would happen. Um, and so drum rituals will happen, again, according to divination, the Orishas will be thought to ask um, to have a drum played. And what that means is that it, it can either be unconsecrated drums that play the drum rhythms of the Orishas, or there is what's called an orchestra of three drums called bata. And those bata drums are consecrated, and they are the ones that 
um, are really um, prepared in such a way um, that they are they are perceived of as being orishas themselves, the bata drums. They belong to Shango. Um, but when they are played, the sacrality of the event is a really elevated um, you know, situation. When there is a bata drumming or a wemilere, um, you can really expect that people will be mounted by the spirits. This is a possession religion. And possession is a good thing in this tradition. Um, it's one of the ways that the Orishas are really fully embodied in the world. And so, um, you know, th there, there's no set schedule for when they happen. It's just if a practitioner wants to honor their Orisha, if they have a ritual obligation to their, uh, the person who initiated them, or uh, it comes up in like a community-wide divination. So at, at the beginning of the year, for example, um, it's very common that a, a community will have a divination done for like the whole group. And, you know, depending on the divination verse that corresponds to the pattern, um, we haven't talked about what divination involves yet, but, um, you know, forgive me, I'm trying, I'm trying to, um, you know, really kind of render this in a more straightforward way, but, um, you know, depending on what the divination says, basically, there might be, you know, a drumming scheduled for, you know, any number of different spirits. Well, of course, I found out about Santeria in Miami, not in Cuba, because I've never been uh, to Cuba. So I was wondering, what are the main differences between Santeria in Miami and Santeria in Cuba? I think one of the main differences, you know, people will talk about the way that, um, and this, this goes both ways, that there's a lot of anxiety around authenticity in uh, Lucumi or Santeria um, because of the fact that there is no holy book right? There's no Quran, there's no Bible. Um, the initiatory and other protocols that people know and, and how they observe the religion is generally through oral tradition to what, what they learned. Different lineages actually differ in, in certain respects, um, you know, depending on who founded a certain lineage uh, in Cuba people who ramify from those branches of the tradition will do certain things certain ways. So there are acceptable variations in practice, but there's also a huge anxiety among practitioners that, you know, what other people are doing may not be authentic. Um, and so there's all a lot of criticism in the community around, well, you know, this group does things differently. They are not doing things according to, you know, the, the old ways, the ways that were maintained in Cuba. And so in Cuba itself, the way the religion is practiced in Santeria and in, uh, in Havana and Matanzas, which is considered to be the countryside, it's now not that countrified, it's more ur urban, but um, you know, in the early 20th century, uh, Havana was, you know, the urban center, Matanzas is the countryside. And the way that the tradition is practiced is very different because Havana is so much more cosmopolitan at that time. Um, you know, in Southeastern Cuba, where my parents are from, Lukumi really did not take root until like the 40s and 1950s. Okay. And so within Cuba itself, it, there's not a standard uh, kind of way of practicing. But when people talk about the differences today between somewhere like Havana and Miami, what sometimes they point to is the fact that simply because people in Miami have greater wealth, um, the altars are much more, uh, let us say they're more elaborate. They can be much fancier. They can really, you know, display in some sense, uh, to almost to an ostentatious extent, um, the affluence of the person who made the altar, uh, you know, at, at the same time, if, you know, those people who, uh, are, you know, want to critique what's going on in Cuba will say that because, not just the Cuban revolution in general, but because of the, especially the post 1992-93 special period um, when, you know, the, so, you know, there was the breakup of the Soviet Union and uh, Cuba was really suffering from a lack of uh, financial support from the former Soviet Union at that point. There were, you know, dire straits. I mean, I visited my family in 1995 and, you know, cooking oil is very scarce and being rationed. There are all kinds of staples that are being rationed. Um, the narrative is that people in Cuba turn to 
quote unquote, diplo santeria, that they began selling the religion as more of a commodity and even kind of coming up with inventing, quote unquote, or reaches that never existed before in order to basically uh, earn their livelihood. You know, initiating foreigners into the religion who, you know, might, might be initiated properly as priests, but never have the intention of learning anything else right, who may never even return to Cuba. So there's a lot of criticism around, you know, the variations in practice that take place in Cuba, not because of um, lineage variations, but because of these kind of, I think, more sinister motivations around making money, um, you know, around kind of uh, being able to sell the tradition, right? And then, I, I mean, I've been to Cuba, and people say the same thing, though, about the U.S. People will say, well, you know, once, you know, that uh, one of the criticisms actually is very gendered, very sexualized. They'll say, well, you know, in the U.S., it's it's like a gay religion because gay men are so prominent that, you know, it's Cuban lukumi that kind of like retains its virility, its masculinity. Um, and there's a scholar, Aisha Beloso de Jesus, who's written a book called Electric Santeria, where she kind of talks about um, this kind of way that nationalism creeps into the conversation um, and gender um, also, you know, becomes a factor in the way that people talk about the differences. Um, I mean, from an outsider's point of view, in some sense, what I see as being a major difference is that um, the palo is much more an espiritismo, okay, the tradition of spiritism is in some ways more visible in Cuba. Um, you know, the, the kind of the way that the urban geography is laid out in different Cuban cities is such that um, you will see people who are initiated into Lukumi who are wearing white walking down the street, but you'll hear different drum rhythms, you'll know of different um, spiritual masses and other things that are going on. There's a whole uh, actually musical genre called cajon that is played uh, for Congo spirits and for uh, the spirit guides of Espiritismo that is very popular. And that's really not as prominent in Miami. Um, it's just a, a kind of the, the greater, I think, you know, secularization, let's say of public space in Miami and in other American cities um, really is more striking to me than anything else. Well, it's very interesting. And uh, among the many things that you said, what struck me most is that, that there are no sacred texts for, uh, for Santeria. This is something I've never thought of. Uh, let me ask you something else. I know you said that uh, the word syncretistic is not suitable, it's not correct, but let me, let me use it. Uh, what are the key aspects of Santeria if compared to other uh, religions that I would call syncretistic, such as uh, candomblé in Brazil or voodoo in Haiti? So when I talk about um, its relationship to these other traditions, I, I look to candomblé. Now, candomblé itself is a kind of catch-all term. So there are candomblé, uh, candomblé called nago or ketu that are very similar to lukumi. Um, there's Candomblé Angola, which is very similar to uh, the Palos, the different kinds of reglos de Congo that I've mentioned, right, oh. because they have Central African spirits. Um, and there are even Candomblé Jeje and, and other forms of Candomblé that they have Eve Fon spirits, okay, that are, there was a whole other Afro-Cuban tradition called Arara, um, where the spirits are from Dahomey, and those are found in Brazil in Candomblé Jeje. Um, and so I look to Candomblé, Nago, or Ketu as a kind of sister religion with Lukumi. They're very similar, and it has it is really not unheard of for a uh, Brazilian Candomblé priest or priestess to maybe attend a initiation ceremony of, you know, a Cuban style uh, orisha worshiper and you know they can tell what's going on some of the songs that are sung to the spirits are very similar uh so songs that are sung to the orishas drum rhythms are very similar sort of the conceptualization of spirits like obatala like shango yamaya and oshum are very similar in candomblé um i think about vodou as being more of a cousin religion 
because the way that uh, Vodou developed in Haiti, I mentioned the Haitian Revolution of 1791. You know, after 1791, there was there were literally no more enslaved people who were going to be going to um, you know the the part of <laughs> uh, you know that that island that is Haitian, right? There there they're not going to be any you know any greater influx of people from West and Central Africa. So Vodou developed in Haiti in a way that was, you know, very autonomous and incorporating um, all kinds of different influences, West and Central African influences. And so um, you have uh, spirits in Vodou that are called Loa, L-W-A or L-O-A. Um, they're conceived of also as part of a pantheon. Um, and there are analogous spirits um, so for example, they're, they're kind of a family of spirits called Ezeli, uh, Ezeli Freda and Dantor are the best known. And they, in some sense, correspond like to Oshun, to Oba, they have features that are similar. Ogun is probably the, the, uh, sp the Lua and Orisha that are the most similar in Cuba and Haiti, but it has kind of key distinctions distinctions um, in, you know, the, the way that um, the Orishas are, you know, are conceptualized as opposed to uh, the Lua. And it really has to do with, um, you know, the factors of, you know, what ethnic groups contributed to the formation of those two uh, religions. And also, um, you know, the, the fact that in uh, Vodou, you have um, like a kind of distinction between hot um, spirits, uh, rituals that are meant to be very transformative called petuo, and then those that uh, tend to kind of maintain uh, positive reproductive and productive cycles uh, that are called rada. And um, rada spirits tend to kind of be more on the Yoruba side or a Wefan side. Uh, Petuo spirits and rites tend to be those that are Creole or, you know, that is to say that we're kind of, you know, taken from Haitian history in a sense or Central African. Um, and, and that's a bit different than what you have in uh, Santeria in Cuba. Well, Elizabeth, many thanks for your time and for very your very precious and uh, detailed and complete uh, answers and information you provided us. So I'm very thankful for uh, this time you gave me uh, for uh, for this interview. Thanks everybody for listening to this and uh, see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.